In this video, we'll be going over statically indeterminate torque load in members. Up until now, you've only dealt with torsionally induced circular shafts with one fixed end and one open end. These types of shafts are referred to as statically determinate members, and here's why. So for the shaft to be in equilibrium, the support will need to produce its own reaction forces and moments to counteract the applied torque T. We'll call this reaction torque Ta. But why only draw a torsional moment? Let me explain with the diagram on the right. I've drawn the same shaft, but I've replaced the fixed support with the reaction forces and moments. Normally a fixed support resists moments as well as shear and normal forces. However, the only applied loading for this particular diagram is a torque. As a result, we're able to disregard the shear and normal forces B and N respectfully. Since there is no shear or normal forces for the support to react to, the values for these forces equal zero. In other words, the fixed support is only producing a torsional moment. Torsion problems only have one equation of equilibrium. Since the only applied loading is a torque, we have to sum the moment about the axis running through the shaft, which in this case is x. The shaft is only considered to be statically determinate if the number of unknowns is equal to the number of equations. As I previously mentioned on the diagrams, each fixed end produces its own torsional moment. And as I just stated, we could only use one equation of equilibrium. Since we only have one fixed end, we'll also only have one unknown. Thus, the number of unknowns equal the number of equations. As for the title, I'll be introducing you to statically indeterminate torque loaded members. The shaft is only considered to be statically indeterminate if the number of unknowns is greater than the number of equations. Now let's try and visualize this with the figure on the right. This particular shaft has two fixed ends. Since the number of reaction moments correspond to the number of fixed ends, We'll end up with torque at each end of the shaft. We'll label the reaction torques at A and B, T A and T B respectfully. I determine the direction of these torques using the right hand rule, where my thumb is pointing away from the cross section. With the addition of the second fixed end, the number of unknowns increases from 1 to 2. Meanwhile, the number of equations remains the same. Since the number of unknowns is now greater than the number of equations, the shaft on the right is indeed statically indeterminate. As you might be able to tell, the equilibrium equation won't be enough to solve for the torques at each end of the shaft, and so we'll need to consider a few more things before we're able to solve for these unknowns. On the following slides, I'll go over what we need to solve these types of questions. Before I go over the general procedure, I want to cover the concepts we'll be using. I'll start off with the compatibility equations. We'll be using this to compare the angle of twist for the various segments based on the boundary conditions. I'll explain this in more detail with the diagram below. When the torque T is applied to the shaft, it will normally produce an angle of twist. However, the shaft has two fixed ends and so it's in equilibrium, meaning that the reaction torques at the support counteract T such that the angle of twist is zero. To help explain the compatibility equation, I've drawn a free body diagram for the shaft on the right. I drew the directions for the various torques based on the right hand rule, where the right direction is positive. As I previously mentioned, the shaft is in equilibrium, so the angle of twist is zero. It's important to keep in mind that the angle of twist at fixed supports equals zero. Now based on what I just said, the angle of twist of point A relative to point B equals zero. We can also state this notation as the relative angle phi between point A and point B equals zero. Now we'll need to break up the shaft into two segments. This is because the angle of twist is not constant all the way through. This is due to the applied torque at point C as well as the supports. We normally take cuts at the location in which torque is applied. We'll use the relative angle of twist between point A and C to represent the first segment. And we'll use the relative angle of twist 
between point C and B to represent the second segment. If we take the sum of these two segments, we'll end up with the following expression, where VAB equals VAC plus VCB. While writing the equation, it might help if you think about it like this. If you write the subscripts of V side by side, the points in the middle should cancel out, such that you end up with a fraction for the initial notation. This part here represents the compatibility equation for this particular example. We will be needing this equation for the constitutive law. The constitutive law uses a load displacement relation to express the angle of twist in terms of torque. In other words, we will be using the angle of twist formula to develop the relationship between TA and TB. To help explain how we apply the constitutive law, I have included the free body diagram from before. We will also need the compatibility equation from the previous slide, where VAB equals VAC plus VCB. Now as per the constitutive law, we have to express the angle of twist in terms of torque. We will use L1 to represent the longitudinal distance from point A and C, and we will use L2 to represent the longitudinal distance from point C and B. We will also use TA and TB to represent the T values for segments 1 and 2 respectively. As a result, we will end up with the following equation. This represents the equation we developed using the constitutive law for this particular example. On this slide, I'll be going over the general procedure used to solve statically determinant problems. The first step is to draw the free body diagram. The second step is to use the method of sections to write out the equation of equilibrium. We can accomplish this by summing the moments about the x-axis. The third step is to utilize the boundary conditions to write out the compatibility equations. The fourth step is to apply the constitutive law to express the compatibility equation in terms of t. And the final step is to use the equations we developed in steps 2 and 4 to solve for the unknowns using the system of equations. As an alternative approach, we could also apply the principle of superposition. Since it's still a statically indeterminate problem, we could simply separate the shaft into manageable statically determinate problems. We could then sum the results to get the final solutions. For instance, we could take the following shaft, remove the support at B, and separate it into the following two diagrams, where the first diagram only contains the applied loading, and the second diagram only contains the reaction torque at B. We could solve these diagrams individually, and some of the solutions to get the final answer. Now this concludes the video regarding statically indeterminate torque loading members. In this video, we discussed what statically indeterminate members are. We also went over the general procedure used to solve statically indeterminate problems in addition to its corresponding concepts. We also quickly talked about the principle of superposition and how it could be used as an alternative approach. In the following video, I'll be doing an example for this section.